Hello, I'm Amit Bhagwat, uh, the chair of the content committee at ISA. We are here at ITAC, the premier conference of ISA in New York. And with me is Len Bass, who, is, um, who has been a keynote speaker yesterday and who is with us to talk us through um, a few concepts related to architecture and design. Um, Len has been in the industry for a very long time. He did his PhD in 1970. And uh, he is a person of great research and academic distinction with many uh, peer recognition awards to his credit. And in the recent past, he has had something like 84 selected papers that he gave me from his work of about last 10 years. So a lot of uh, knowledge there in, in one single person. And then I'm going to begin with um, the topic that you, you spoke a bit about yesterday, um, finding where architecture is vis-a-vis -vis design. I started my career as a chief designer, and then at some point I assumed uh, the title of architect um, without really a huge amount of change to my to my job because I was as a chief designer I was looking after a team of about hundred people who were who had good constructive and analytical ability. As an architect, I continued to do something along the same lines. Where do you see uh, the the marketing point if there is any between a the two roles? and the two uh, descriptions. So architecture vis-a-vis -vis design and architect vis-a-vis -vis designer. So, so I think the answer to both of those is, is roughly the same. So, mm -hmm. so an architect has system-wide responsibilities. So something becomes architectural mm -hmm. in one sense if it, ha if, if it has system-wide implications. Mm -hmm. So a decision is made uh, uh, that has system-wide implications, an architectural decision, it ought to rise to the level of the architect. Um, uh, uh, a designer, ha, 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 even a chief designer, has a uh, uh, smaller scope in terms of, or should have smaller scope in, term, <laughs> in, ter in terms of their responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so they might be in charge of a subsystem or some smaller piece. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they would make the decisions with respect to the smaller piece okay. uh, uh, in consultation with the architect if it had system-wide application. Okay. Now, now, part of that is also just, just uh, uh, title inflation. Mm -hmm. And so there's this uh, architect has become a desirable title over the last mm -hmm. 10 years. And so people want to have architect on their, on, their, uh, on their business card, and you will see people whose responsibilities do not change at all, but their title does. Okay. And so that happens as well. So the lines are not mm -hmm. very precise in that sense. Okay. So for example, if I was looking after, let's say, five teams of 20 designers uh, delivering uh, five different systems, then maybe chief designer wasn't a good title for me? Probably. I would say that was probably an incorrect title. Okay. Um, now, you, you referred to the way these titles have changed. Uh, I do remember there was a time when the designations used to be something like systems analyst, and they suddenly became solutions architect, all of them. Um, is that simply words that don't mean anything, or is there a fundamental shift from being more analytical, uh, kind of doing more pre-compiling, if you like, to just seeing if something works and going ahead? So when I first started in the business, which mm -hmm. was 1964, uh, I was a programmer. Mm -hmm. Okay, So what I did as a programmer, probably was not that much different than what people as system analysts mm -hmm. uh, did in, in, you know, 15 years ago, which is probably not that much different than, than, than we designers do these days. Mm -hmm. uh, the scope of the system has changed. So, mm -hmm. so, so when I was programming, we were worried about systems of, of, of several thousand, 10,000 lines, 20,000 lines. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, these days, it's much more in the order of 100 or, or, or even a million lines. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, so the scope has changed, but the, but the kinds of activities that people do have not changed, just the titles. So, so in that sense, I, I, would, I, would, I would agree with you. Then I have had one question for the last few years. Uh, enterprise architecture, when we talk about, we are talking about an enterprise which is a whole, uh, it is driven for and by the business, and then there is information flowing around, and then technology is enabling the whole process. And then a lot of people talk about systems engineering, where again there is a system of humans and uh, various inputs and outputs and uh, software and hardware and so on. And these two disciplines seem to have evolved fairly independently, uh, systems engineering and enterprise architecture. Personally, I happen to be a lead systems engineer in one government project because that project said we are using a systems engineering. That was the stakeholder statement. 
Otherwise, I have been lead enterprise architect in most of the projects. Now, it, it could have been my naivety or simplicity of my mind, but the two things appeared a lot similar to me when I was uh, trying to lead them or putting them together. Um, is there a distinction? Is there a boundary? How do they relate? So, so I like what Owen Woods has to say on this subject. Uh, uh, so this isn't original with me, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but I'll say it anyway. The, uh, um, the, the, the thing you want to look at are, are, are the, the sphere of control and the time frame. Mm -hmm. So if you're building a system, you're con whether you're a system architect or a software architect, you're concerned with a particular system. It has inputs, it has outputs. How should you construct it? Mm -hmm. And your time frame is on the order of how long is it going to take to build that system. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's say two, three years. Big system. Uh, if you're an enterprise architect, mm -hmm. you're concerned with multiple systems. Mm -hmm. You're much more concerned with how systems interact. Mm -hmm. You're concerned with setting up some set of standards that the, that the systems uh, uh, that are constructed will adhere to. Mm -hmm. Your time frame is much more on the order of five years than it is on uh, uh, two or three years. And so I would say the two things are fundamentally different in that, in that sense. Um, the next thing you mentioned yesterday, architecturally significant requirements. And uh, it has been my observation, I mean, coming from uh, a systems engineering background, a lot of work that we do early on as a proof of concept to see that the system has the likelihood of surviving and being built uh, is related to capability or uh, what's called the quality attributes of the system. It comes out of non-functional requirements. And yet at the same time, uh, that, that is a good day scenario, happy day scenario. But at the same time, it's very difficult to tell your stakeholders, your budget managers, that non-functional requirements are, at the end of the day, more re important in ensuring that the re uh, functional requirements deliver. Any tricks? Um, so, so one, the first step in that is to clearly identify what the, what the, what the, what the quality attribute requirements are. Mm -hmm. And so, and there are a number of techniques you can do for that. So if I talk to somebody and they say, well, you know, we just want performance, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we don't care. And you say, okay, is a week response time sufficient? Mm -hmm. And they, they will say, no, 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 no. It's got to be much faster than a week. Mm -hmm. uh, so so you, 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 you take things to a, a, an extreme mm -hmm. and, and, and that'll generate a reaction. Once you have the quality attribute uh, uh, requirements clear, mm -hmm. Since, from a technical perspective, the quality attributes are going requirements are going to drive the design, mm -hmm. uh, then what you have to do is decide which ones are going to be the most difficult to achieve, mm -hmm. which ones are the most problematic, which ones have the most influence, and you do that in conjunction with which ones have the uh, highest business value. Mm -hmm. So, so it's 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 the two factors. Once you've done that then it becomes a matter of, uh, of persuasive skills in terms of telling your manager that, that you know, the, 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 the stakeholders or the customers or, or whoever will, will consider this system a failure if it doesn't have the following qualities. Mm -hmm. We need to track that. We need to do things to ensure that it will. We need to design to ensure that this, that this is uh, uh, going to happen and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that there are any tricks in, 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 in that scheme. It's, it's just a matter of identifying what the largest risks are mm -hmm. and knowing from the technical side that, that the risks are, are, are frequently in the quality attribute realm. Mm -hmm. And then saying, look, if these are risks, we have to track them. Mm -hmm. 